Uh, all right. So those of you of a certain age and national television market may remember a commercial for Reese's peanut butter cups in the 1970s, in which two pedestrians collide while snacking and their collision generates a serendipitous if improbable synthesis. Hey, you got chocolate in my peanut butter, one complains, while the other retorts, you got peanut butter in my chocolate. That's the feeling I had around 2003 when I was trying to make sense of a cluster of Nigerian literary texts about oil that featured characters who were palm wine tapsters. These texts use a literary mode that drew upon the fantastic idiom of a, of a Yoruba narrative tradition in which the bush, so-called, is peopled by mysterious creatures. As I was trying to figure out what was happening in these narratives, my reading around in the literary critical discourse on magical realism alternated with getting up to speed on social science analyses of the political ecology of oil. Like the peanut butter chocolate epiphany, my aha moment came when I recognized that the workings of petromagic, as theorized by anthropologist Fernando Coronel and geographer Michael Watts, might intersect in interesting ways with the literary mode known as magical realism. Petromagic collided with magical realism, and voila, petromagic realism. As an early attempt to think about the relationship between literature and oil, this 2006 essay was a seminal argument in the emergence of what would become known as petrocultures and the energy humanities. In my remarks today, I want to look beyond petromagic realism as a literary mode in order to consider instead the broader role of petromagic in the fossil fueled imaginary and the lived experience of hydrocarbon modernity. This talk is very preliminary, very much uh, in progress, as a sketch toward a chapter in a new book project with the working title, The Fossil Fueled, Ima the Fossil Fueled Imagination, How and Why to Read for Energy. In my remarks today, I'll reflect on several versions of petromagic that underwrite the present, and I'll consider the relationships between petromagic and the pedestrian, by which I mean both a prose style and broader aesthetic disposition, as well as a mode of mobility that might po point toward an alternative embodied politics. Let me begin with petromagic. In the magical state, Fernando Cornel argued that in a petro state like Venezuela, rents from oil extraction seemed to endow the state with the magical power to remake the nation. Paraphrasing Cornel's argument, Michael Watts theorized what he called petromagic, in his words, the fetishistic qualities that oil harbors as the bearer of meanings, hopes, expectations of unimaginable powers. These analyses by Cornel and Watt echo those of journalist Rizard Kapuscinski in his 1985 book about Iran. Kapuscinski describes the false promises of oil, which creates the illusion of a completely changed life, life without work, life for free, the internal human dream of wealth achieved through lucky accident through a kiss of fortune and not by sweat, anguish, hard work. In this sense, oil is a fairy tale and like every fairy tale, a bit of a lie. Oil fills us with such arrogance that we begin believing we can easily overcome such unyielding obstacles as time. All surplus all the time is the fantasy of oil. Oil promises wealth without work, progress without the passage of time, the narrative, sorry, the narrative mode appropriate to these petro promises is not the incremental developmentalist progress narrative of modernization, but instead the fairy tale of instant transformation at the wave of a magic wand in which every dream of infrastructure comes true. This analysis of petromagic underwrote my thinking about petromagic realism in, Niger in Nigerian literature. More recently, I've been thinking about petromagic in a different sense, not a fairy tale promise in the realm of political economy that's way too good to be true, but instead the technological sublime lurking quietly within the way things actually work. Consider how the everyday tedium of filling the gas tank brings us into contact with peculiar forms of matter, which we tend to give hardly a thought. How can we understand the discrepancy between the quotidian rhythms of pumping gas on the one hand and the sublimely discrepant timescales at work in fossil fuels on the other, the ways in which the geologic past, technological present, and environmental future overlap and collide? 
a kind of petromagic is at work in the ratios and equivalences at work in fossil fuels, which quantify energy in terms of vast stores of matter, or to calculate the muscular equivalence, whether human or animal, of machines that run on min mineral energy. How many oceans full of tiny sea creatures had to die and fossilize over how many millions of years in order to produce the 10 or 20 gallons of gas that you put in your tank? Answers to these questions appear in the work of scholars like Tim Mitchell and Bob Johnson, who tell us that the energy derived from coal in 19th century Great Britain would have required forests at least eight times the size of the entire country in order to generate the equivalent amount of energy from wood, or that the transition to mineral energy in the early, in early 20th century U.S. industry, it was as if a billion wild horses had been harnessed and put to work. I'm staggered by the imaginative energy invested in these ratios, which calculate X number of gallons of gas to how many oceans, or X number of years of fossil fuel combustion to how many centuries and eons of sedimentation and fossilization, or which measure coal mines and oil wells against non-existent woodlots, underground forests, imaginary horses, in armies of inanimate workers. At some point, the equivalences calculated in this arithmetic give way to an alchemy that turns dirty energy to gleaming gold. The fantasies and false promises at work in these counterfactuals enable an economy and infrastructure of the as if, where one reaps the benefits of resources that one does not actually have. To some extent, my thinking is consonant with that of anthropologist Gisa, Wil Wis sorry, Gisa Wiskalnis, who theorizes what she calls oil's magic slash materiality by attending to the complex technological and social processes through which crude oil is transformed into myriad useful, valuable, and potentially harmful forms of matter. Wiskalnis seeks to reorient the analysis of petromagic away from scholars' critiques of people and places seduced by the promise of oil, where magic functions as a mere metaphor for false consciousness, unrealizable economic fantasies, or other immaterial aspects of oil's perceived powers. From this perspective, critics who express skepticism about those who succumb to oil's seduction may be blind to its material workings in the world. But what's missing in Wiskalna's account, to my mind, is the way in which this magic slash materiality is actually experienced and understood, particularly within formations like petromodernity. I argue that the great paradox of fossil fuel imaginaries is that in literature as in life, oil is at once everywhere and nowhere, indispensable yet largely unapprehended, not so much invisible as unseen. We tend to ignore or forget the improbability or magic of this energy regime. Fossil fuels should be enchanting, but they tend not to be. These ratios will blow your mind if you let them, but we mostly don't let them. That is the secret of Petromagic's conjuring trick. This failure to recognize or reckon with the transformations indispensable, sorry, reckon with the transformations inherent to the indispensability of mineral energy, the bedrock of life as we have known it, amounts to a massive failure of the imagination, a normalization of the make-believe world of the as-if economy that ignores what is actually happening. It's a particular version of what I describe in my book, The Disposition of Nature, as a quarantine of the imagination, by which I mean an inability or refusal to imagine across geographic, temporal, or experiential divides so that what happens over there seems unconnected to where one stands over here. In this sense, the characteristic mode of thinking about energy, at least for those with uh, secure access to it, is actually not having to think about it the unrecognized privilege of taking energy for granted. I want to think about this constitutive disregard as the normalization of petromagic, a kind of disenchantment that results from not noticing, not reckoning, and reckoning with the forms of magic and fictions of surplus, to quote Imre Zeman, on which so-called normal petromodern life depends. <clears throat> 
One of the key concepts in energy humanities is impasse, a term that names an individual and collective inability or unwillingness to take action at a scale and speed adequate to the crisis, the crises that we face. My point is that the impasse of the present result, results both from flights and failures of the fossil fueled imagination. In other words, impo, impasse results not only from Petra Magic's enchanting fairy tale false promises of wealth without work, but also from the disenchantment of taking for granted the stupendous powers that fossil fuels actually put at our fingertips. Ultimately, my point about this version of Petra Magic has to do with what we mean by modernity. What I want to suggest is that rather than being a process of disenchantment that dispels and neutralizes gods and monsters, spirits and specters, modernity entails both enchantment and disenchantment in close and complex relationship to each other. So far in this paper, I've been trying to think through the paradoxes of Petra Magic, which entail both the myriad promises and imaginative flights of fancy associated with fossil fuels. When it becomes banal and taken for granted, the quotidian experience of Petra Magic involves a posture of disenchantment or boredom with those flights of fancy. So that Petra Magic becomes prosaic or pedestrian in the adjectival sense of dull, ordinary, every day. I want to turn now to the, to, to the pedestrian and pedestrianism, which intersect with petromagic in some surprising ways. In Living Oil, Stephanie Lemonager offers a meditation on pedestrianism as a way of breaking through impasse. Since its founding in the mid-19th century, Houston has been an important site for the latest technologies of mobility, railroads, deep water ports, space travel. Not unlike the way that climate change is opening up the Arctic for oil exploration, the availability of air conditioning in the mid 20th century suddenly turned hot and steamy Houston into the corporate epicenter of the US oil and gas industry, a boom which meant that perhaps more than any US city, Houston has been built around the automobile rather than the human body. This is the context for Lemonager's account of walking in Houston, which she describes as living the metropolis with a conscious intention of plotting it for yourself so that you can feel it and know it as a geographically empowered resident, a citizen. Pedestrianism becomes political action and therapy, a means of moving literally, physically against the melancholy of oil dependence. What better way to begin plotting against oil in Houston, Alberta, or Los Angeles than to get out and walk near the water? This notion of pedestrianism as plotting entails an alternative embodied praxis in politics. For Lynn Menager, plotting has a dual sense that brings together narrative and its plot logics, what she calls narrative intelligence on the one hand, with little acts of resistance to the world that oil has made on the other. Let's walk a little further along this path to consider other ways that the pedestrian is good to think with, both the noun form that designates a person walking as well as the adjectival sense of everyday, ordinary, or common. Indeed, within this word pedestrian, there is an entire history and ideology of mobility. In its most literal sense, pedestrian is opposed to equestrian. Both words derive from ancient Greek, and there's an implied class difference in the distinction between those who must go on foot and those who ride on horseback, or today those who use mechanized transport, pedestrian as opposed to automobility and its purported freedoms, to which I'll return in a moment. But the use of pedestrian as an adjective to mean common or ordinary also traces is back to classical Greece. The ancient Greek word petsos, literally on foot, was also used metaphorically in an aesthetic sense to describe a writing style that was dull, prosaic, leaden, or un and uninspired, unable to get off the ground, as opposed to writing that was like the flight of Pegasus, the mythical horse with wings and friend to the muses, inspired words on the wing flying high. The dull, prosaic, and pedestrian versus the lofty inspiration of Pegasus. This classical aesthetic distinction carries us back to Texas, where the mobile oil company took the Pegasus as its iconic company logo. 
This rotating neo sign flew above the company's Dallas skyscraper, the first, first such building in the city beginning in 1934. This branding strategy deployed the Pegasus to evoke not only the unfettered mobility of a mythical flying horse, but also mastery over the forces of the earth. In Greek mythology, the Pegasus brought lightning from Mount Olympus. It could create fountains of water from the earth by merely striking its hoof on the ground. And I really like the visual echo between the pottery shards and the neon skyline. Against the Pegasus of mobile oil, I return to Le Menager's exhortation to consider how we might understand plain old pedestrianism as a little resistance, the small steps that bring us closer to a reckoning with the taken for granted workings of Petra magic in order to help find a way beyond petroleum on the other side of impasse. And yeah, there are several complications to consider with regard to the possibilities and pitfalls of pedestrianism as a politics. The first thing to observe are some interesting similarities across these disparate discourses on the pedestrian. In Le Menager's account of walking and plotting in Houston, there is a whiff of Michel de Sorteau's seminal essay, Walking in a City, which takes the pedestrian as a key figure in his broader consideration of everyday life. But recall that de Sorteau's essay begins not on a Paris sidewalk, but in the skies above lower Manhattan, on the 110th floor of the World Trade Center. It's not Pegasus, but instead Icarus, whom de Soto invokes to describe this aerial view, from which he looks down upon earthbound crowds that, though visible from on high, are themselves unable to see down below. Those are his words. This sky-ground distinction recurs throughout discourse on the pedestrian. Icarus is a mere human pretender to the Apollonian perspective in the sky. Apollo is to knowledge and vision what Pegasus is to poetic inspiration. They both soar above the earthbound. The figure of the pedestrian, in turn, has been compelling to those who seek to undermine the privileging of those transcendent perspectives. And I'm skipping a section uh, where I discuss how Franz Fanon contrasts flying in an airplane with walking on the ground as modes of knowledge production. Having shown how the pedestrian, in whatever sense, tends to be defined explicitly as belonging to the earth rather than the sky, I want to examine anthropologist Tim Ingold's provocative remapping of what it means to walk. Uh, Ingold theorizes walking, um, uh, I skipped ahead a little too soon, uh, this quote will come in a moment. Ingold theorizes walking as thinking and movement and ambulatory knowing, as a rejoinder to a Kantian model of knowledge in which the mind soars in the sphere of reason. Rather than reintegrating earthbound feet with soaring mind, Ingold emphasizes the lungs and thereby remaps the relationships among the body, the earth, and its spheres. And here you see, he says, the pedestrian body simultaneously walks and breathes. Exhalation follows in inhalation as step follows step in a closely coupled rhythmic alternation. A living, breathing body is at once a body on the ground and a body in the air. Earth and sky are regions of the body's very existence. And Ingold identifies this amphibious situation, a, a ground air situation, with organic life itself. He says, wherever life is going on, earthly substances are binding with the medium of air and the ongoing formation of the ground, a process, he says, that's epitomized by plants. From my reflections here, what's so suggestive about Ingold's account of walking is that it deflates the atmospheric extremes that have served as a foil to notions of the pedestrian and pedestrianism as unwillingly tethered to an unexamined lowly ground. This understanding of walking, Ingold's understanding, brings the Empyrean sky down to earth. From an aesthetic perspective, it knocks the Pegasus from its perch. I'm not a classicist nor an earth scientist, so I don't have any idea which layer of the earth's atmosphere was the preferred zone for the flights of Pegasus. But I am fascinated by how Ingold reimbues breathing, inhalation, exhalation, respiration, with the world-creating capacities that poetics reserves for inspiration. 
The classical muses, an extra human force of creativity who were understood to breathe into and thereby enable would by poets, sorry, would be poets, are recognizable from this slantwise materialist perspective as more than human co creating kin, co conspirators, to borrow Natasha Meyer's term. To walk and think along with Ingold is admittedly a bit exhausting. And I gave you just kind of a brief overview of, of his account of walking. Sometimes you just have to get somewhere, maybe somewhere you've gone a million times before. Pedestrianism as magic is perhaps just as susceptible to disenchanted taking for granted as petromagic. At the risk of re-entrenching the distinctions that I've been trying to complicate, we might say that there's walking and then there's walking and many more forms of walking besides. In order to tease out further the relations among these several pedestrian modes, let me offer another set of examples. All other concerns and assumptions are vastly different. I'm struck by the resonance between images of walking as collective world making in Ingold and Franz Fanon, at least in the account of Achille Mbembe, who identifies walking as a crystallized image of the collective rise of humanity that he sees as Fanon's central project. You see here that Mbembe reminds us of Fanon's stirring exhortation, we have risen to our feet and we are now moving forward. Who can settle us back into servitude? Mbembe observes that in Fanon's logic to walk, to, to, sorry, in Fanon's logic to think was to walk with others toward a world created together unendingly, irreversibly within and through struggle. This idea of walking is thinking, struggling, and creating a world together becomes an emblem for Mbembe's own exhortation at the end of a critique of Black reason, where he confronts not only the long-standing crises of racism and inequality, but also that of biospheric collapse. This urgent task of creating a common world begins for Mbembe, the moment that people stand up, walk with their own feet, use their own hands, faces, and bodies to write their own histories as part of a world that we all share, to which we all have a right, to which we are all heirs. There's a utopian democratic heroism in this get up, stand up version of pedestrianism as politics. But I also think that the limits of this heroism are evident in this untitled image by Mozambican photographer Koknam. The socialist realist billboard at the, at the top of the photograph <clears throat> is a leftover from Mozambique's post-revolutionary period. Its exhortation, Aluta Continua, the struggle continues, quite literally points in the opposite direction as the trajectory of the pedestrian cart poolers and pushers for whom one imagines life's daily struggle never ends. As Rui Asabuji and Patricia Hayes observe in their reading of this photograph, the load of firewood on the cart resonates ironically with revolutionary ideas of kindling the masses. Here the masses are reduced to playing the role of draft animals. This energetic reading leads me to wonder whether the posture of he, the human figures on the right is proudly erect and high stepping or merely a response to the exertions of pooling and mirrored, mirrored in the bent postures of the pushers. Note also, as with the bipedal humans standing in for four-footed animals, that the wheel of the cart calls attention to the absence of the motorized vehicle from which it seems to have been salvaged. Asabuji and Hayes further observe the clash of temporalities at work in the image with revolutionary time fixed and survival time moving. The time of progress is frozen or disrupted and the time of survival goes on. I'm going to skip a section on the trope of procession in the work of, of William Kentridge, in which I find a sense of immobile mobility, displacement without hope of, uh, hope of arrival. In the remainder of this talk, I want to focus on a question that's been implicit in much of what I've said so far. What does it mean to make progress? It might seem strange to raise this question in the wake of the late 20th century suspicion cast upon grand narratives, the greatest of them all, the progress narrative, a linear, unidirectional, and upward march toward better and better things. <clears throat> 
Consider the cluster of hockey stick graphs that visualize several processes of social and environmental process, uh, uh, social environmental change since 1750, accelerating into exponential growth since the 1950s. Some of those lines used to point toward progress. Now growth and progress seem to diverge more by the day. And I recognize, it's a pet peeve of mine, I recognize that you can't make out the words on the PowerPoint, let alone the numbers, but that's kind of the point that the shapes are relatively similar. And <clears throat> just for your reference on every single graph, um, the, there's a date on the X axis that's 1950 with a line. And that's the, the line of the great acceleration of all of these processes of growth. Fossil fuels have been understood to be the material substrate of progress as in Nipesh Chakraborty's observation that the mansion of modern freedom stands on an ever expanding base of fossil fuel use. Pedestrianism then might name a chastened mode of mobility at odds with fossil fueled flying high. Indeed, pedestrianism itself has often been understood as the enemy of progress. American style automobility was an important part of the Western model of modernization and development promoted to newly independent nations during the Cold War. In a study published by the Brookings Institution in 1964, the American transportation expert Wilford Owen distinguished between mobile and immobile nations. The mobile nations were all wealthy and the immobile all poor. These ideas had legs, or perhaps I should say wheels, in shaping development policy and practice. Mobility scholar John Howe remarks that the promotion of motorized mobility became the primary objective of the major development agencies and most governments in the global south. To be poor was to be a pedestrian, to be modern was to be a motorist. Howe's analysis of the export of American automobility to the developing world begs to be juxtaposed with Matthew Huber's arguments about how, how oil shaped politics and the built environment in the United States. In Lifeblood, Huber shows how US political economy in the 20th century was organized around managing oil's surplus and sometimes scarcity, an imperative whose most salient spatial expression was the heavily car dependent American suburb and whose ideological expression was a right wing libertarianism premised ironically given its material and infrastructural dependencies on a uh, on, sorry, on staunchly defended notions of so-called freedom. Thinking contrapuntally between the US and the global South suggests another conjunction of petromagic and its disenchantments. I suggested that US Cold War priorities played an important role in shaping patterns of transport planning in the development world, in the developing world. But the global dissemination of desires for mechanized mobility is also a function of the expanding cultural hegemony of the US, which was quite literally driven by the automobile. David Alworth makes a startling yet quite sensible claim about American cultural production. Since the dawn of the post-war era, so much of the most important work has emanated from an encounter with the physical sites of American automobility. What walking was to the British romantic poets, driving has been to American textual and visual artists since the mid 20th century. Yet as Huber argues in Lifeblood, the American norm of automobility has exacted great costs, even upon his fiercest adherence, particularly when the oil shocks of the 1970s made the American dream of two cars in the suburban garage, the highway commute, and the Sunday drive suddenly unaffordable. Some of that American petromagic that was sold to the rest of the world became not only disenchanted or taken for granted, but also a trap. Circling back to that key question, what does it mean to make progress? I wanna push for, further some of the contradictions of automobility by returning to the predicament of immobile mobility, impasse on the move that I see in the processions of William Kentridge. Scholars of automobility have argued that its promises of individual autonomous movement are never as good as they sound. Mobility for some too often comes at the cost of immobility for others. The extended capacities for movement enabled by combustion engines, the, the, the combustion engines that still dominate, dominate transport in the United States, have a dark side in the forms of compulsory mobility and unwanted immobility 
that result when cities, regions, and countries are designed around and premised upon the automobile and the spatial expectations that it creates. Whether you live in Lagos or Los Angeles, New York or Nairobi, you don't have to be a scholar of, automobil of automobility to know that driving on the open road is off all too often a brief blessed interlude between traffic jams. This recognition confounds the seemingly stark contrast between the humbleness of pedestrianism and the exuberant velocities and spatial appetites of fossil fueled flying high. But it also complicates what energy humanities scholars mean by impasse, that predicament of knowing where we stand without being able to take adequate action. Impasse tends to be described in terms of stasis, blockage, or stuckness. But what if the sense of immobility associated with impasse is also part of the problem of impasse? In other words, aren't the practices, expectations, and imaginaries of historically unprecedented mobility within petromodernity part of the status quo with which we have failed to reckon? Understood as stasis, impasse connotes an unwilling, sorry, impasse connotes an unwanted inability to move. This physical condition, what physics would call bodies at rest, has little to do with the embodied and infrastructural realities of hypermobility associated with fossil fuels. For this reason, it seems to me that inertia offers a necessary corollary to impasse. I'm thinking of inertia not in the colloquial sense of weighed down, not wanting to move, but instead in the, Newton in, in the Newtonian sense of a body's resistance to change in its state of motion. Bodies at rest tend to stay at rest. Bodies in motion tend to stay in motion. Folks accustomed to driving everywhere, to hours-long commutes, to reckoning their status in terms of thousands of miles flown in the calendar year, these folks are bodies in motion who will tend to stay in motion unless, as Newton also observed, they are acted upon by a greater outside force. Among the pandemic's effects is the sudden recognition of what stuckness has felt like for many. Stuck going really fast all the time. Right as inertia, impasse becomes legible as a continuing state of motion that one does not want to or cannot abjure, running to stand still. This compulsory mobility, a mobile immobility, is the counterintuitive inertia that is characteristic of our accelerated age. In other words, impasse is just as much at work when traffic flows freely on the highway as when it's come to a standstill in a traffic jam. One of my favorite literary texts for thinking about impasse and inertia is Henrietta Rose Innes's short story, Poison, which imagines the aftermath of a catastrophic chemical explosion in Cape Town. The story's protagonist is a middle-class white woman named Lynn. Dragged down by the inertia of everyday habit, Lynn belatedly flees the city and runs out of gas just short of a petrol station on the highway. As I discuss elsewhere, poison depicts the racialized polarities of automobility in South Africa by juxtaposing Lynn's understanding of the highway as a surface not meant to be touched by hands or feet. With her sudden recognition, <clears throat> Sorry, with her sudden recollection of the people she'd seen so many times on the side of the highway, walking, walking along verges not designed for human passage. What interests me today is Lynn's experience of automobility as a form of inertia that doubles as identity. In all of her years at driving at speed along highways, Cape Town, Joburg, Durban, she'd never once stopped at a random spot, walked into the felt. Why would she? The highways were tracks through an indecipherable terrain of dun and gray, a blur in which one only fleetingly glimpsed the sleepy eyes of people standing on its edge. To leave the car would be to disintegrate, to merge with that shifting world. In, Lynn, in Lynn's previous normal life, so-called, automobility offered a way of not living in the world beyond the highway, the car as carapace. The reversals and transformations in this passage are not as startling as those of quantum physics, but notice that Lynn finds clarity, coherence, and self-knowledge in the blur of driving at speed and the threat of disintegration in the thought of leaving the car, walking into the indecipherable terrain, and merging not with the highway traffic, but instead with the shifting world that is standing still. To step out of the car, to leave this high-speed inertia behind, would be to walk away from what she knows as herself. This account of automobility as inertia and identity has two related implications. 
Put simply, cars don't necessarily take us as far or fast as we might imagine they do, but they can be so tightly wrapped up with who we think we are that stepping away from this inertia can seem nearly impossible. Frederick Buell asks, even though an oil-saturated society may be completely unsustainable, it also seems impossible to walk back from. Is it even possible, theoretically or practically, to walk back from a metamorphosis? Buell's notion of walking back is different from walking away or walking against, as in Le Menager's account of walking in Houston. <clears throat> to walk back means to correct an error by withdrawing a statement or reversing a process, in effect, turning back time. In this sense, walking back complicates what we mean by progress. You have to go backwards in order to move forward. I said earlier that pedestrianism has been understood as the enemy of progress, particularly since the rise of mechanized transport. My examination of the contradictions of automobility sought to loosen the tight association between progress and fossil fuel mobility. I'm aware that my remarks could be reductively summarized as something like walk, don't drive, which would be as inadequate an argument as I can imagine. Okay, sure, I do like walking, but my aim is to understand how the unspoken assumptions and unremarked contradictions of pedestrianism and petromodernity quietly shape our dreams and desires, as well as the spatio-temporal imaginaries in which they are implotted. These putatively distinct modes of mobility are not as easily disaggregated as we might think. In this talk, I've argued two rather different things. First, that the normalization or disenchantment of petromagic is something equivalent to the wondrous having become ordinary or pedestrian in the aesthetic sense, which contributes to the predicament of impasse or not even knowing where we stand with regard to energy. And second, that the earthbound materiality of pedestrianism <clears throat> sorry, the earthbound materiality of pedestrian mobility might offer a knowledge producing and world making process of plotting against the status quo that has been theorized by critics as diverse as La Menager, Ingold, Fanon, and, and Mbembe. And yet such plotting might not get us anywhere, at least not very fast. The most fundamental contradiction between pedestrianism and petromagic is this. Progress is an idea explicitly premised upon the act of walking, putting one foot in front of the other, stepping forward. The word derives from a Latin phrase that Lucretius uses to describe the advance of human knowledge and civilization. <clears throat> Starting in the middle, practice and therewith the experiences of the eager mind taught them little by little as they went forward step by step temptem progrientes. So little by little, time brings out each several thing into view and reason raises, raises it up into the coasts of light. In this seminal topography of the progress narrative, movement through both space and time is charted as an ever upward aiming line. Here progress is the promise of pedestrianism, a promise of incremental transformation step by step change at the scale and speed of the human body. From this perspective, magic names a theory of change that rejects or skips the incremental process of progress. As I said at the beginning of this talk, petromagic promises progress without the passage of time. The incrementalism of pedestrian progress is similar to the logic of one less. One less car, one less plastic bottle, one less plastic bag or paper napkin. These little resistances are founded upon a hope for big things to come. As Fanon, Mbembe, and Ingold know well, incrementalism has a utopian spirit, the power of just one multiplied by a multitude, which imagines itself as a collective in the making with the power to change the world one step at a time. As philosopher Lewis Gordon remarks, the best response to Zeno's paradox of movement is to get up and walk. One can hardly not acknowledge the appeal of this incrementalism in its version of imagined community. Let my one less join, <coughs> sorry, let my one less or one more join with yours and yours and yours. But the question for these little resistances is how they may, might bring big changes, how the incremental logic of one more or one less might add up to doing things differently and doing so in time. Somewhere between petromagic and the pedestrian may lie an alternative to the inertia of the everyday, 
as I've suggested, Petra modernity is perhaps most inert when we, when we move along the highway at 70 miles an hour. But I am painfully aware that the incrementalism of pedestrianism can sound like a neoliberal prescription for individualized discipline that is all too compatible with status quo. What then is the difference between pedestrianism as getting somewhere, even at five kilometers an hour, and procession as impasse marking time? Is it possible to chip away at impasse one step at a time? What kind of temporal imaginary can possibly be adequate to the present? These questions feel more urgent each time I voice them, each time I sit at my laptop to nudge the cursor a little further down the page. If one of automobility's early enticements was the thrill of acceleration, that thrill has now transmogrified into a kind of terror that neither Paul Virilio nor Wolfgang Schivelbusch could have contemplated in their analyses of speed and accidents, the terrifying acceleration of the effects of petromodernity on the Earth's system. Why, you might ask, am I hung up on incrementalism when the idea of inevitable and irreversible progress is so obviously in shambles, on fire, underwater? Instead of gently urging, walk, don't drive, shouldn't I be screaming, run, don't walk? In other words, what is the role of incrementalism in an exponential world? The slow process of increase envisioned by Lucretian progress is arithmetic, adding one quantity to another, rather than exponential multiplying one quantity by another. Perhaps the moment that growth becomes exponential, progress stops, or at least gives way to something else. Perhaps we unwittingly left progress behind nearly a century ago in the shift to exponential growth fueled by energy dense hydrocarbons. And I should pause and say that I, I'm thinking of the progress narrative as a fiction rather than thinking that progress has actually been happening um, uh, over the past uh, 200 years. <clears throat> In her essay, Good Grief, the novelist and conservationist Lydia Millet writes, we'd kill to believe in magic. Contemplating feelings of paralysis in the face of climate change and a major extinction event, Millet observes that these crises have reversed the enlightenment relay of knowledge, action, and power. The more we know, the more paralyzed we feel. Magic here names a deus ex machina that, at Millet write, as Millet writes, could swoop in and get us out of this mess. But she warns that the magicians of our age are techno-utopians whose hubristic faith in their own powers puts us and others at enormous risk. <clears throat> Thus, Millet concludes that the only true magic of which humans are capable, our superpower, if you will, is a reflexive self-awareness of our limits as well of our, as of our powers, which can be put to work to re-envision our systems within the world we were given, the nature we were given, whose capabilities we don't yet fully understand. Here, Millet redefines magic as a capacity to know and act with a circumspection that we might call pedestrianism, that's what we might, might, might call pedestrian, in a way that's adequate to the crises we face, perhaps. A more modest and materialist way of creating knowledge to live by. From this perspective, clinging to humble incrementalism in the face of accelerating exponential threats is terrifying, but it may be the only survival trick we have. Thank you.